Hello, and welcome to Yolanda Nava, Do You See What I See? Today, we have a passionately creative and productive guest. He is documentarian, director, and author, Jesus Trevino. Jesus is perhaps best known for his direction of the a long-running drama, uh, Chicago Hope, but he has done uh, dozens, dozens, if not hundreds of documentaries and film, and is an immensely uh, creative and award-winning talent. Welcome, Jesus Trevino. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank well, you it's great much. to be here with you. Yeah. The uh, I want to go back to your very beginnings because I was really in a state of awe when I read your bio, and I, I'm aware of your career in general, but the specifics and the many awards and the many uh, films that you've done and documentaries is really incredible. And what is most amazing is you started as a student. And yes. Tell um, how that happened. Well, you know, I I I I, I got involved in the uh, Chicano movement back in 1968. And at the time, I was a student uh, going to, to college, a, a senior year at Occidental College. And we had done a canned food drive for the farm workers. And um, we, we drove up to Delano uh, with our canned foods that we had collected as a donation to the struggle there. And it was my opportunity to, to meet with, for the first time, to meet with Cesar Chavez. And I must say, it was a life changing meeting. Uh, at the time, I was basically a young Chicano hippie. I, I was, you know, um, kind of a bit nihilistic, um, kind of drifting. Um, I was a philosophy major in school, uh, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And um, when I met Chavez and saw this humble man um, working so hard uh, for the freedoms and the dignity of his people, I had to, it forced me to look at myself and to say, well, what are you doing? What contributions are you making? And I realized that I was not doing anything. And so it really uh, changed me. And uh, it was at that moment um, that I committed myself uh, to becoming um, not just a part of the Chicano movement, but to dedicating my life to bringing about social change uh, for the betterment of our people, uh, the Latino people, and, and ultimately human beings in general. Uh, you know, we, we, we focus on Chicanos, on Latin America, uh, you know, Latino Americans, but really our concerns are the concerns of any human being on the earth Everyone wants to have a good life, uh, wants to be treated with dignity and respect, and doesn't want to be exploited. And um, and so I think we we start our, our homework at home, working with our own people and trying to um, to you know liberate them, liberate ourselves uh, before we can you know do much to help others. Uh, but certainly uh, my perspective is uh, to try to better. Um, the world for for everyone. Well, that was a very exciting time because it was, you know, there was the uh, Vietnam War going on. There was there was a lot of protests going on across the country. There was just an aliveness and the the idea that we could make change happen. And I was, you know, I got uh, drawn into all that too. And I about the same time period. I was in graduate school at that point at UCLA. And uh, and the uh, what was interesting is that I think I met you uh, a little bit later when you were working uh, as uh, covering uh, covering uh, uh, different uh, concepts and, and, and issues for KCET television, and you were covering the inquest for the Ruben Salazar murder, and uh, it was at that time that uh, you know I started really paying attention because. That was a, a very critical day and, and time in my own life, too. I think that was a very informative time for many of us of our generation. You know, the a group of, you know, give us a few years here and there. What I, I and I was just recently reading, uh, it's all <laughs> listening to, it's all in the Frijoles, and in your contribution to the chapter on justice. And you made the statement that, that the inquest of uh, the Ruben Salazar uh, death 
was a whitewash. Why has it been so difficult to get the real story out about that uh, incident? Well, you know, even back in the day, uh, of course, the inquest uh, was a response to a, a riot that had taken place, a police-provoked riot, and um, the burning of, of many buildings in East Los Angeles and the, the arrest of over 500 people. And um, the, um, the authorities that, that be uh, were concerned that this could continue. And so they needed to quell the, the social unrest that was going on, the justifiable social unrest. And um, there were a number of community leaders, uh, clergy in particular, that said, you know, we don't know how long we can stave off uh, people's human reaction to being mistreated the way the police have done. And so they decided, well, let's have an inquest to, to air all of this. And the idea was that if they had this inquest into the death of Ruben Salazar, uh, they would be able to, um, um, you know, quell the community and, um, and perhaps uh, find out what, it, what had gone wrong or what had uh, caused his death. Of course, um, in fact, uh, what really transpired was that the uh, police authorities utilized the inquest to justify their attack on the people. Um, and the first couple of days of the inquest, in fact, were nothing but um, um, items that were being presented that showed uh, community members throwing rocks at police uh, or police cars uh, without any explanation that people were reacting to um, the police having attacked them without any reason or recall a reason for, for them to do this. And the number of people that, that had gotten brutalized by the police. Um, and that was, was not what the uh, inquest was, you know, intended to do. They, they wanted to basically paint a picture of uh, an unruly community that had provoked uh, the police when in fact it was the opposite. It was the police that had unjustifiably attacked uh, the, the people. And of course, uh, the inquest resulted um, in, a, in a verdict uh, that uh, Ruben Salazar had died at the hands of another. And it showed, they showed uh, who that other was. There was a deputy sheriff firing a tear gas canister into the Silver Dollar Bar and that canister did, in fact, uh, hit Salazar in the head and killed him. But no charges were ever brought to bear. And, of course, by then, uh, the community had quieted down and, um, and it had achieved what the authorities wanted, which was to, to basically chill everyone out. Uh, but uh, there was certainly no justice that was ever um, you know, revealed during this process. No, I was there that day. I was a wide-eyed, innocent graduate student, and I attended a peaceful demonstration that I was part of. I was in the park with grandparents, parents, children on their father's shoulders, toddlers on mother's arms, and, you know, in, uh, you know, strollers, grandparents there. It was a peaceful day of music and taught speeches in a park. And I was there and we were, the, all of a sudden the tear, the baton started coming down, the tear gas started flying. I had to get out of there. I don't know how I got out of there. I followed somebody away. I didn't know the neighborhood well. And uh, uh, so what happened that day uh, was a violent attack on the peacefully uh, gathered people in the park. So you're absolutely right on that. It will hopefully be cleared up at some point. It continues to be a mystery. But it isn't the mystery, because most of us who have looked or read or read any of the reports uh, know what actually happened that day. And truth will be revealed at some point, I hope. Uh, the, the, uh, the interesting thing is that you went from there to making a whole series of documentary films. And some you've been awarded for, what is it, the Blood Sangre de Raices de Sangre. And uh, you've done some very, very important work. Over the, over the decades of your life, what 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 sparked the the uh, the 
total, I mean, you mentioned the total dedication to this movement and to, to, you know, to justice and to using storytelling and documentation to, to cover things and to bring them out to the light. But you've done so much. You did. You set up, created Latinopia. You, you became very involved in the Writers Guild, the Writers and Directors Guild in Los Angeles, which was a very important thing for you to do. You've been honored by them. And um, the trajectory has just been an extraordinary output of very important, productive work. Tell us about some of the highlights in that, which you highlighted in your book, Eyewitness. Well, you know, I, I would have been very fortunate in that um, I got my start at KCET early on, and um, I, I quickly um, was uh, in a situation where I could, um, you know, uh, originate programming. Uh, I got, there was very supportive uh, person uh, there, the general manager at KCET was very supportive of my efforts and understood the need to have more of a Latino presence on public television. And I began doing documentaries, and as it coincided, uh, I, I, I happened uh, to be at a lot of the key events uh, and key movements that were going on at the time, the Rasunida Convention, for example, in El Paso, Texas in 1972, uh, Reyes Lopez Tijerina and the land grant movement in New Mexico, the farm workers in California, um, the um, Crusade for Justice in, in Denver, Colorado. I was there filming all of these events going on. And so I saw firsthand um, what our people were doing and, and how we were trying to coalesce and shape our presence in a society, in a country that had denied us our, our rightful presence and um, had, had in many ways um, discriminated against us, and it was a whole generation, a, a baby boom Latino generation of Chicanos that were affirming, ya basta, we've had enough, and we're going to bring about social change. And I felt um, early on, the first time I, I showed one of the little Super 8 films I had done uh, of a picket uh, in East Los Angeles, and I showed it in a community setting, and I saw the response of our people to seeing themselves up on a screen and to seeing our issues being dealt with up on a screen. And I thought, this is a major um, um, thing that I need to hold on to because this is educating our people and it's bringing about a social awareness of the issues and themes that we must dedicate ourselves to and from then on, I knew that media was going to be, um, you know, my my forte. And I went from doing documentary work at KCET to doing independent documentaries. And then I decided um, I'd always wanted to work with actors. And, um, and, and I decided to see if I could segue my way into directing, um, you know, actors. And, and I managed to... Um, after many years of struggle, a uh, break into episodic television directing. And I spent many, many years directing primetime television shows, everything from Star Trek, uh, Next uh, uh, Voyager, and, uh, and um, Babylon 5, uh, science fiction shows, to uh, hospital shows, ER, Chicago Hope, to, to um, uh, criminal shows, uh, Law and Order, uh, criminal minds, uh, and and so I was successful in 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 that, and um, and this allowed me to um, to continue to make my presence and to get involved with the Directors Guild. Uh, for me, it wasn't so much the Writers Guild as the Directors Guild, and I for a while I was on the the national board of the Directors Guild, and um, I helped create the Latino committee of the Directors Guild that still exists today and, and does wonderful work. And so, you know, I was, I was able to, to make my impact felt and uh, I've continued. And after retiring from television directing, I created Latinopia, which is an online service that uh, provides videos and uh, blogs uh, about our community, our, uh, and, and focuses on our art, literature, music, theater, cinema, and food. 
And so I've continued to do that. And apart from all that, I've also been a writer. And um, I've written uh, my memoir, which you mentioned, uh, Eyewitness, a filmmaker's memoir of the Chicano movement on Arte Publico Press. And, um, and also I've written uh, three collections of short stories, um, the, the Fabulous Sinkhole, The Skyscraper That Flew, and Return to Arroyo Grande. Uh, I've created this fictitious world uh, uh, and community of young people uh, and we follow them from the time they're 14 and 15 till the time they're adults. Uh, and it's fun, it's a, it's a fun um, a fictional world that I've created. And um, more currently, I'm, I'm working now on a, a book um, that uh, I hope will be a, a, a legacy that we leave for future generations. Uh, it's called the Chicano Documentary. And in it, uh, I'm going to be focusing on landmark Chicano documentaries that have been done by Latinos about our reality here in the United States and how important it is that we have, uh, in creating these documentaries, we have really educated all of America about who we are as Latinos. And so I think we've made an incredible contribution, uh, not just to our own community, to educating ourselves about ourselves, but certainly educating the wider, larger community, largely through a lot of PBS shows, uh, done by a number you know, of filmmakers, not certainly not just myself, uh, but many filmmakers who are Latino, who are Chicano, uh, who have contributed their work and collectively, uh, we have made some pretty amazing documentaries. There have been amazing things done and I, I wanna go back a little bit in, in, your, in your time frame because I, you did uh, you did a, a, a documentary on on Alamo, and I mean on the uh, yeah the Alamo the attack. The Alamo, yeah, and yeah. It was it was actually a drama. Uh, it was called Seguin, and it was I asked myself uh, what were the Mexican Americans doing uh, at the time in the Alamo, and it turns out that there were many uh, Mexican Americans uh, who were Tejanos. They had been born and raised there in, in San Antonio. And um, when um, Santana's army came, uh, he wasn't only interested in going after the, the gringos, if you will, but he was interested in acquiring the land that was owned at that time by other Mexicans, by Mexican Americans or Tejanos. And in order to defend their lands, they joined with the Anglos inside the Alamo. Um, and of course, we know the outcome of that. Uh, but one of the major figures who was sent out of the Alamo to get help was uh, a man named Juan Seguin. And he later became mayor of San Antonio, Texas, uh, after the, the fall of the Alamo um, and after the, the uh, birth of the uh, Texas Republic. And when the Mexican-American War transpired, um, he found himself being banished uh, from, from San Antonio, from Texas, because he was Mexican. And he wound up uh, fighting on the Mexican side of the Mexican-American War. And um, he died in Mexico, but was reburied in the town that today bears his name, Seguin, Texas. Interesting. Wasn't part of that uh, that uh, uh, Santana Mexican didn't want to see Texas become a slave state? That was that was certainly part of it, yes. And of course, the the North Americans, the the Easterners who came over, um, you know, they were invited at first by the Mexican government, but soon they uh, kind of took advantage of the situation, and they wanted to grow Texas as um, as a cotton growing, you know, place. And um, and um, that that was one of the things that, uh, of course, uh, was being uh, fought for by Santana. Uh, and of course, um, you know, you look back on history and um, it was, um, you know, the, the Mexican, to my mind, the, the Mexican Americans, the Tejanos uh, who, who were living at that time were in a sense, the first Chicanos. Um, they were bilingual, they were bicultural and, um, and they uh, understood both worlds, uh, but they were citizens of this country. And so they had to find a way to survive 
And, um, you know, historically, um, we, we, we know that history shows how in many, many instances, um, they were, you know, exploited, certainly after the Mexican-American War, uh, they were exploited by, by the uh, invasion of uh, Anglo-Americans. And, um, and, and we are still facing the, that legacy today. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think Latinos in general, Mexican-Americans in particular, uh, have had years and years of, ha of discrimination uh, that we've had to overcome. I think it's very important that with the uh, creation of this new Latino Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., that these stories, these films that you've created and others need to be included as part of that new museum. And the other piece is that connected to the Texas and to the Mexican-American War, it was the Mexicanos and early Californios in California who prevented California from becoming a slave state. So these are important issues and contributions that we have made as a, as a people that have never been raised in the history books. And we now have a new uh, piece of legislation that is going to create uh, ethnic studies as a graduation requirement in California. It, comes, it goes into effect in two more years. And I think this is an opportunity to bring in all these, this new history that is not part of the history that needs to be told in order to help heal, heal all the woundedness and, and, and suffering that, that, you know, many of our people and other people in minority groups have, have been suffering and uh, continue to suffer. So it's a, it's an opportunity. I see this as an opportunity now to, to repurpose all of this work, you know, that you've done and others have done in the, in the movements. Well, that's one of the rationales behind my uh, undertaking this this massive study of uh, the documentaries, because I think, you know, you have documentaries like the Longoria Affair, for example, where um, Felix Longoria was a World War II hero who came home and was not uh, allowed to be buried in his hometown mm -hmm. because of the Anglos. And, uh, and Lyndon Baines Johnson stepped in and um, wound up uh, arranging for his for uh, Longoria's body to be buried at uh, Arlington uh, National Cemetery in recognition of, of his heroism. And, and so you have instances like this where our documentaries have told uh, the untold story of, of America. Uh, because this is not just a Chicano story, it's an American story. And, you know, where, where, where is Texas? Where's California? Where's New Mexico? Where's California? They're in the United States. And the, and the history of the people in those places, the Chicanos there, is the history of America. And so I, I, I'm just so impressed that so many of my colleagues... Uh, people like Hector Galan, like Silvia Morales, Susan Racho, Lourdes Portillo, um, uh, you know, um, Paul Espinosa. I mean, there's so many uh, great filmmakers who have been documenting key moments in our history and showing the injustice and, 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 and you know, bringing it to light and, and also showing the accomplishments uh, of our community, showing the, the hero stories. And so this is all part of what I think uh, I, I'm hoping to leave in this book, uh, the Chicano documentary. Well, I think it's very important because I, I as a student of history, you know, I, I take very seriously the adage and the thing that we were told in every history class I've ever taken. You know, uh, we haven't learned from history uh, and we can learn from history in order to uh, write it because of course history is written by the victors of most wars or wars. And, uh, and so that's something I take very seriously. And I think it's very important that our textbooks and our school books and our general uh, image of, of peoples in America and of the American uh, process, the, the movement to uh, make a, uh, you know, manifest destiny across the entire continent of the America, that we include these stories as well, because these are stories of contribution and they're very powerful. And yes, and you know, the sad part is that, uh, and the feature in the narrative arena, um, we have not been as successful. Uh, we have some great filmmakers like Moctezuma Esparza, for example, and Gregorio Nava, Luis Valdez, who have been able to achieve some uh, headway there in terms of uh, bringing our presence um, uh, to the big screen. 
Uh, but in comparison, certainly to, um, you know, to African-American community or other communities, uh, we, we haven't been as, as prolific as we, we should be and, and as we ought to, to be. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think um, I'm, I'm involved with a, a thing called the Mexican-American Educational Cultural Foundation. And um, we are uh, providing scholarships uh, uh, to a group of uh, 25 to 30 Latino graduate film students. Because our hope is that by encouraging uh, film students, the students that are today's students, um, that we will in 10 to 15 years uh, create a generation of filmmakers that can begin to make some difference in terms of uh, cranking out films about our community and about our presence. Uh, and it's only going to be if, if we, if we uh, cultivate the younger filmmakers today. And fortunately, we have a number of uh, mentors uh, people like, you know, Bell Hernandez, for example, and, um, you know, Dennis Leone, uh, a producer, a writer, um, you know, Luis Valdez, I mentioned. Uh, there's quite a number of, uh, of um, activists um, who are acting as mentors for this younger generation so that they will, um, you know, address filmmaking, not as we, uh, my generation did, which was doing it a la brava without any guidance but now we have mentors now we can we can say here's how we did it you know and and be encouraging and supportive in that way well this is important it's important uh, ongoing work and and the the writing of history uh the the writing meaning making it upright including making it more inclusive and make us aware of all the social movements that have helped make this a great nation and that need to be furthered because we've gone a bit backwards in the last several years and we're just kind of getting things straight again. I was very happy to see the results of the recent uh, midterm election. But we have to keep the democracy and all of these all of these movements have been part of this uh, moving towards that more perfect union. I love that phrase in the Constitution because that's the goal and we haven't gotten there quite yet. So these are important things to you know to engage in. The uh, I love the theme in your in your new book. You, we were talking about this the other day on the telephone about memory, and I think in our in our generation, you know, I, the older I get, I, I these these things keep popping up because you know, fifty years of history are flying by in my you know in my life and in my head. And I was I like as a journalist, I was there for many of these events and saw them firsthand. And certainly have read more and beyond to understand, you know, the background of history of everything. But it's uh, you want to get it down on paper. So talk about memory and the importance of memory. Well, I, I do think that um, you know, particularly as as we get to be, you know, our age, um, you look back and and you see the importance of the contributions we've made. Uh, they've been incredibly unique. Um, and masterful, uh, you know, a whole generation of young people uh, who went on and, and went from, uh, from being students to honing out careers in education, in medicine, in, in you name it, in communications and in, in the entertainment industry, uh, um, you know, social workers. I mean, you know, we've had a whole generation who dedicated themselves to giving back to our community. To helping improve our community, and and I, a lot of them, I see them that we get together every now and then, and they're still at it, and and I think this is very very important uh, that you know we're getting, um, you know that we have this generation that continues to this day, uh, to um, you know to to do what we've been doing all of our lives, which is um, creating history, and it's important. Uh, not to forget that and to um, memorialize uh, our contributions and the legacy we're going to leave. And I think that's uh, that's our, our cue to uh, <laughs> kind of conclude. <laughs> well, I, 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 there are other questions I want to ask you. We'll have to save it for another time and another year because uh, I was interested in your projections into the 21st century uh, that you included in your eyewitness novel uh, book, memoir. 
And so I want to thank you very much for joining us and for your many, many contributions over the decades of your life. Uh, you make us proud and uh, we'll keep moving all of that forward. So thank you so much. Let, let me just say, Yolanda, that I'm very proud of you for doing what you're doing and continuing to keep the spirit uh, alive and, and uh, the flame of, of our progress alive. Um, and it, it's really an indication that all of us uh, need to and can contribute and continue to be part of uh, the important movement we started more than 50 years ago. That's right. And we'll keep going. And thank you so much. All and right. to the audience, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, I want to wish you a very uh, blessed Hollywood uh, holiday season and new year. Peace, joy, and love. May we have that more and more in the coming year. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in January for another edition of Yolanda Nava, Do You See What I See? Thanks for joining. See you then.